And so it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker tonight. So Ruth Baleko, FAIA, is a partner at the Muller Hall Partnership in Seattle, Washington. Ruth has over 20 years of experience in creating spaces that change the way people interact. Ruth received both of her Bachelor of Architecture and Master of Architecture from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign um, before joining the Muller Hall Partnership in 1999. Today, she is a partner in that firm. As a senior design lead in the office, she has worked on a number of award-winning projects, including the Fisher Pavilion, the Olympic College Pulsoba Campus, apologies, Vancouver Community Library, the Odegaard Undergrad Library at the University of Washington and Renton Library. By embracing a variety of typologies within a singular project, she has expanded the way architects design learning, teaching, and working spaces. Her expertise in translating a client's vision from iconic form and expression has enabled her to bring together both the functional and inspiration aspects of design. In this way, Ruth's work is on the forefront of adaptability and continues to embody the future through her transformation of typologies for knowledge and discovery, collaboration, creativity, and exploration of research. As an advocate for continual improvement and refinement, she has shared her experiences and breakthroughs through frequent speaking engagements across North America. We are thrilled to have her open. Please help me welcome Ruth. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I heard all the good buzz when everyone came in today, but let's take a minute, turn to someone nearby you that you don't know and connect for a minute. Let's, let's get a better handle on who's here. Okay, that's great. So obviously we have a few things in common, which we're finding, and, uh, but I thought it would be great to um, just get a sense and set some context for who all is here for the next two days. We have 200 plus attendees registered. We have 66 graduating classes spanning from 1957, are you here? And we have prospective graduates of 2023, are you here? Stand up please. <laughs> Woo! Um, I took this next stat personally um, because I have a fond spot for 1988. 1998, stand up. <laughs> because, oops, 1986 really outshone every single year. 17. Okay, way to represent. Um, okay, so why are we here? In some form or another, architecture brought us here to be part of the first ever gathering of female graduates of the School of Architecture. It's a big deal. In addition, I would suggest that this is not merely just a celebration or a retrospective of what we've all done over the, the past years until we arrive. Um, I would suggest it's also um, more about where we are going and how and why. We have the first ever opportunity to share in dialogue to make new connections, and most importantly, daylight new questions for ourselves about what it means to be part of the field of architecture going forward. I graduated, um, I think Marcy did a great job. I can't believe everything she said. Um, I lost track there for a second. I can't believe that's um, where I've been over 20 years. But Marcy and Sarah did ask me to just kind of recap a little bit about the journey. Um, since I left Illinois in 1998 with a bachelor's and a master's. 
Um, and I think, you know, going through school, you have no idea what you're going to encounter. Um, school prepares you for so much, um, but so many more things come your way. And uh, I think, you know, some of the things that have come my way in that, that post-school journey um, is, um, you know, my training in architecture, I think, more and more I realized what it gave me was the ability to think critically, um, creatively, to be able to take constructive commentary, um, but also to employ humor and empathy to forge bonds with teammates and clients. My appreciation for architecture gave me the opportunity to travel and live overseas and to see how the built environment shapes places and people and vice versa. The practice of architecture brought me to a wonderful firm of extremely talented, engaged, and thoughtful architecture architects at the Miller Hall Partnership. In many ways, our culture still feels like the family business started by Bob and Dave, our founding partners, in 1977 after their time in the Peace Corps. Bob's time spent building schools in Afghanistan, um, and uh, you know, Dave spent time building housing, public housing in Brazil. And really, that public service and that commitment to working hands-on in communities fused mission-driven design into our firm's DNA from day one. That commitment has allowed us to work for like-minded, mission-driven clients um, that are all trying to impact their communities with a value proposition. Um, and these are projects, you know, just some of the ones I've worked on, um, the Vancouver Community Library in Vancouver, Washington, um, the Renton Library, which is a, a 70s structure over a, a, um, a salmon habitat over the Cedar River in um, just outside of Seattle. Um, the University of Washington's Odegaard Library. Um, the Health Sciences Education Building, which is currently under um, design at the University of Washington's um, you know, <coughs> nationally ranked med school. And then lastly, a project that's under construction and will open next summer. Um, which represents kind of the, the president of the university and the Gates Foundation's signature initiative to affect the health of the population of the world. So no pressure <laughs> in terms of <laughs> giving them office space. Um, but I think, you know, I'd be the first one to kind of um, share that my life's journey um, in architecture only represents one of many versions um, of what women's presence in and out of the field looks like. And you know, our classes have been graduating 50-50 for years, um, you know, since before we graduated. Um, but by mid-career, the profession isn't 50-50 anymore. We've lost 32% according to current statistics, the AIA and equity by design is tracking. So I think it's really important to kind of step back and say, um, well, where do, we, where do our colleagues go, right? And there's, I think what they've documented in the equity by design study is that there are these pinch points, and traditionally. Some of them are starting to evolve and kind of soften, but these pinch points of coming out of, of college and maybe you graduate during a recession. You don't even make it to the profession, possibly, because there just aren't, aren't jobs. Maybe your pinch point is trying to um, pass exams and pay for exams while working at an entry-level job. Maybe the pinch point is um, now you're licensed and working, but you're trying to start a family or raise a family or maybe care give you know, for other family members. Um, and traditionally, the profession hasn't always made room for, for those other opportunities. And then later in the field, at some firms, there might be a glass ceiling. Not at all, but some. And so I think traditionally, this is where we have started to kind of see that drop off of 32%. So, how do we change that? I think traditionally, you know, we've thought, um, well, we just need to really make sure women get more opportunity while they're in the office. Then we'll really crush it. And I think to a certain extent, that's true, right? Um, so what does that look like? I think, you know, at Miller Hall, it looks like um, we make sure that entry-level employees and interns are exposed to a whole range of things that architects do. I think when I came out of school, the tendency was to make sure all the interns sat and drafted their little hands off, <laughs> um, maybe or maybe not getting paid. Um, so we really look at it as part of our job is educating and exposing them and growing them as young architects. Um, we pay for hours for, um, for volunteering, and we pay for hours for continuing ed, 
We support licensure by keeping current study guides in the office and also reimbursing staff members when they pass. And then, um, you know, we also want to make sure that the commitment to growth doesn't end in the beginning of a career. Um, you know, mid-career opportunities and, and outside of project sponsorship is really important. And so one of the things that we have instituted is the Bob Hull Research Grant, which anyone in the firm can submit for. Um, and we have a jury every year, and it comes with um, a notable um, financial stipend, but also hours that, you know, out of um, the workplace for them to take it on. And this year, two um, young architects just a couple years out of college um, won it. They teamed up with a proposal for constructing media, um, where they're really looking at how, as architects, we graphically communicate and represent our work. So we'll see. Um, they have to turn it in by the end of the year, so we'll see how they do. So these steps, you know, um, serve to entice professional growth and retain our staff. And, you know, the profession needs women. It's, you know, statistically documented. Um, oops, I'm going to go a little bit more. Lost my little spot here. Um, I think um, it's statistically documented that women's presence in, the fir in architecture makes a difference. Um, and so one of the things we want to think about doing is not just giving kind of that support while you're in the profession. Um, we also need to make sure you're supported as a whole person. And I think that's where some of those pinch points have shown up traditionally. Um, so what does that look like? What we've found um, is that it looks like ensuring equity and parity, um, both in pay and leadership opportunities. Um, support at home. It's actually statistically documented that if you offer paid paternal leave, you're setting up equal parenting from day one. And that goes a long way, it's documented, to making sure women have equal shot at coming back to work. If you're setting up equal parenting load right from day one. So we actually pay for paid parental or paternal leave for our male architects to make sure that their wives, who are often architects, um, are getting that shot. Um, and we're seeing them take advantage of it. Um, we also make sure that while parents are out, male or female, they're staying connected to the office. They're still invited to events that we have or our weekly design panel. Um, we send them photos about how their projects are going. We're still checking in. Um, and what that does is hopefully it's making it less daunting for them to come back if they still feel that connection. Once they come back, we know that the job isn't over. That's just when it starts to get hard. So we, over the years, have really um, come to value both flex hours for parents, you know, often double income families trying to get kids to school or to soccer or whatever, um, but also not making 40 hours mandatory. Um, if people are contributing to the firm, the hours they contribute are valuable whether it's 32, 36, 40, 30. I, don't, I think when I first started at the firm, you know, the culture in architecture definitely was if you're not 40, you're, you know, you're not worth the seat. Um, so I think it's really exciting to see that um, coming from firms, not just ours in Seattle, but a lot. It's much more common in the profession. So I think, you know, one of the markers and the ways we kind of keep score on this, um, our managing partner likes to say you can't improve what you're not measuring. Um, does anyone know about the JUST certification that ILFI has established? Yeah. Um, it, we kind of like to think of it as an organic label for businesses, not just architecture firms. Um, it allows you, if you register um, under the JUST certification, um, to score your firm, honestly and authentically. And it really daylights how you're doing. You might think you're doing great, but this actually forces you to do the calculations on pay equity, um, leadership equity, where are your philanthropic dollars going, it, are your employees safe and in the office or at job sites, um, what benefits are you giving them, what kind of diversity you have, and you often have these little gaps that you don't know where you have. And so this, um, we renew it every year, we have to recheck our statistics, um, and we're very proud to say that um, we're 52% women, and we are also 52% um, women, just a little bit above in the, the pay equity. So I think um, it just helps, it keeps you honest, um, which we think is about walking the walk. Um, 
so these steps all serve to entice kind of professional growth, right? Um, and I think it's deeper and more culturally meaningful than just checking a box on a scorecard. Um, and for us, it's because, you know, we see firsthand, we believe it, and Bob and Dave, since the beginning of the firm, it's just been intrinsic in how we operate, that women improve the, the, the discourse, the conversation. Um, we treat situations differently, especially those ones that get hot-headed in the job trailer out at the job site, right? A bunch of people banging the table with their tempers. We come at it differently. We forge connections with clients differently. We ask different questions. Um, and often we see it as a competitive advantage when we go in and interview for projects and we see the team come out and it's all men. Yes. <laughs> and and that, that has just happened, you know, in my, the duration of my career, which is not that long. So I think, it, you know, it's really, I think it's really exciting. And I think, in my opinion, there's another reason that more and more opportunities are growing for women in architecture, and that's because Architecture today depends on a multifaceted team of generalists and specialists. We need data analysts and technical architects and specifiers and renderers and, I mean, you name it, right? Code experts. Um, if we rewind, it wasn't too long ago that the practice of architecture used to look only one way. The singular, often male voice, right? And everyone else was kind of subservient to that. And I think this notion in many ways has become obsolete in the field as more and more complicated buildings are coming together and they demand a team of varied experts. So I think that's just really exciting that the profession is evolving to really include the diversity that, that is our population, whether it's gender, race, economic, or social diversity. Um, you know, we've talked about affecting the trajectory of women while they're in the workplace giving that personal support behind the scenes. But if we really want to make a dent, we need to expand the pipeline. Michelle Obama, when she spoke at the AIA convention a few years ago, said it pretty well. If you don't know about architects, you won't be one. You don't have a shot at it. Same goes for any STEM field. If you haven't seen one out there in your community or no one in your family, you don't have a shot. And that means that all those women never make it to the profession to, for us to even be able to give them that kind of support um, that we're already doing. So how can we do that? Well, I think a lot of us here at Illinois have seen it in action. Um, local efforts allow us to see these impacts right in our backyard, right? The, the image on the right is from Discover Architecture, formerly known as Atelier, um, where high school students can come and test it out and really get exposed to what it is. Um, I know some of us here um, both went to that program or taught with Kevin in the summers, um, and it was just a great experience to see students kind of having their eyes open. You know, ACE Mentorship is another national program that brings in high school students into offices um, and works with architects, um, contractors, and engineers, exposing them to the, the various fields. And then our firm has both a summer bridge and open studio programs that bring in middle school and high school students. Now at the same time, academically, um, we can help you know, continue that support that we forged in middle school and high school. Let's keep that pipeline wide um, and inviting. And I think, you know, at our firm, because Dave Miller taught at the University of Washington, he only recently retired um, where he served as the chair of the department. Um, so for 30 years, um, and I think, you know, what that commitment meant to the firm, what we saw it as is that it was implicit. You were always encouraged. If you were invited to take part in a crit at any university or travel to be on a jury, to take time off and teach a studio, it was encouraged. You knew it wouldn't affect the trajectory of your career. You wouldn't be sidelined if you made, if you took that time off. And because Dave spent time with the best and brightest, um, day in and day out, he appreciated the value they could bring to the practice day one. He knew they were bringing value. He knew all the great ideas and thoughts and, and challenging questions and talents they had. So he, he, they immediately had a high-level advocate the day they hit the office. We also contribute to scholarships and endowments for students that need a little financial help. Um, I know many of us here were recipients of those um, 
for people looking out for us. And I think um, we make sure that each of the schools that our partners went to, um, University of Washington, Washington State, University of Oregon, and University of Illinois, uh, we all have endowment scholarships in place that fund scholarships for um, young students. And we just feel like, you know, people looked out for each of us when we were in school. And I'm looking at one person in the corner, front row. Um, and made sure we were looked after. And we need to do that and pay that forward. So that, that's something the firm does. OK, I'm going to go research here for a second. Um, we can stretch our concept of pipeline, right? I talked about it in a really immediate kind of way. But we can also consider the pipeline a global issue. And you know, we've made ginormous strides worldwide in terms of educational parity and educate, um, you know, access to education. Um, but there are still economic, cultural, and safety-related barriers that impede 62 girls around the world from realizing their right to education. That's from Project Drawdown, where you're seeing some statistics that I'll explain in a minute. Um, education lays a foundation for vibrant lives, right? We know that. That's why we're here. Um, it's also one of the most powerful levers available for avoiding growth in emissions, CO2 emissions. And that's because educated girls realize higher wages, greater upward mobility. Um, they contribute to economic growth in their communities. They're less likely, if they see that opportunity and have it, um, they're less likely to marry as children or against their will. Securing women's right to voluntary um, family planning, access to education, and their own opportunities have, really can have powerful positive impacts on the health, welfare, and life expectancy of both women and their children. Okay, we, we know that, right? But what does that mean? What it means is that if you look at all of these um, top 10 ways to make a difference in CO2 reduction, which is in the news daily, especially in this past week with the, the walkout for climate, which we're seeing um, you know, everyone really take awareness of. What this means is that taken together, educating girls and family planning can make the biggest dent in reducing CO2. Who knew, right? That, that statistic blew me away. And so even more, if we expand the lens of why we're here and what we're representing by being here, it's a big deal. So in the spirit of considering the pipeline a global one, I wanted to spend a moment on a project we finished in 2015. It's Gohar Khatun, and it's a school in Afghanistan. And you know, I, I'm going to pause for a second. This, not only was this project incredibly important to us, but it represented full career cycle for Bob Hall, because he was in the Peace Corps in Afghanistan in the late 60s and 70s building schools. And here he was at the end of his career building schools. And so you know, our office and the University of Washington teamed up to do this project with a local nonprofit. And it, what's really amazing is that um, you know, it's, it's part of Afghanistan's kind of push toward the development of women and girls, and not only their development, but their contributions and inclusion within society. Um, the school does this by promoting stability, comfort, and community engagement. And it's actually become a model for other girls' schools in the country. So if we did all this, each one pitched, you know, each one of us pitched in in a little way, we could have epic impact. We really could, each one of us. Now granted, um, to be honest, some of these things that we've talked about today take firm leadership to put into place. And not all of us are in that situation. However, I do propose that each of us, no matter where we are in life, can find ways to prov provide these forms of support to those who may benefit. For instance, are you inviting a young person to be your job shadow at work? Are you a sounding board for a friend who is trying to return to work after having children? Is there a young person showing promise that you can advocate for? Are you mentoring, teaching, or volunteering with an organization that supports access to education? If we are vested in making this impact, what makes us in this room uniquely poised to take it on?
Is it our history? The University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign is known for some big female-related firsts. Mary Louisa Page was the first female graduate in North America in 1879. And Beverly Green was the first African-American licensed in 1942. That's something to be proud of. Um, is it our pride and can-do spirit? The World's Fair was an epic reflection of Chicago's self-image and American optimism. Is it our architectural legacy? Chicago, you know, it's on everyone's radar. The Chicago School was known for technical innovation and pioneering expression that has changed the face of modernism and skylines around the world. Some might say it's our Midwest sensibility. We're the natural middle ground between East and West Coast, defined by practicality and unable to be written off as a coastal exception. I think it's both none and all of the above. If you made the investment to attend this event, that says something about your bond to this university, to this community, and your investment toward women in architecture. And that, in and of itself, enlists us to get started. So for the next two days that we'll be here together, sharing conversation, digesting the exhibit, making connections, let's capitalize on that buzz that we heard in this room in the first few minutes. Let's use this time to daylight thoughtful questions surrounding our collective and personal relationships to architecture. And as we commence the symposium, the questions I offer to us are, what does the exhibit we're about to go see of our collective work say about our contributions to architecture? How do the notions of pipeline, support, and trajectory bring an additional lens to the panelists that we'll hear tomorrow and Saturday? And lastly, what will each of us take home and put to use? What is our own call to action, personally and collectively? Thank you. What would you say? Oh, you. <laughs> what would you say to undergrad students that are just starting out that aren't too sure of themselves or their abilities? I'm still not too sure of my abilities. I mean, 
right situation? You know, how do we handle that? What's the right decision for this building? How do I handle this meeting? I think it's that sense of just, um, I wouldn't call it insecurity. I would just call it, um, I don't know what the right word is. It's more about you are constantly questioning as a way of making more positive impact. Um, and I think it's at any point in your field, you feel like you've gotten it figured out. Um, you're probably not as relevant as the people who get up every day and, and ask those questions. Just keep coming this way. It's really interesting. Yesterday I was at um, the Urban Land Institute Women's Leadership Initiative dinner. And the conversation I had with the woman next to me who happens to be a zoning attorney at Houston Soares, and her idea of women's equality in the field is uh, in a very pessimistic one, I would have to say, because her, her view on this is, yes, we might still um, talk about equality at the workplace, but maybe it's, we're, we're just concealing what's actually behind the hood. And my question to you is, what sort of systemic change that you think we need to work together towards for it actually to be a reality instead of a, uh, a perception? Mm -hmm. And the follow-up question is, what other industry that we can learn from that can help us? Um, great question about what other industry. Um, I don't have an answer for that off the top of my head, but I think that's a great um, thought pivot that we could carry with us while we're here this weekend. What are, where are other places where we're seeing successful strategies and movements, right? Um, and let's borrow. Um, I, I think that in terms of your, your first question, systemic change, you know, it's going to look different wherever you are. I think we were so lucky um, at our firm because Bob and Dave and our subsequent partners just set the tone. It was implicit. You know, everyone deserves respect, whether you're early career, late in your career, male, female, you know, whatever your background is. Um, so it was just understood. It wasn't like we were off course and had to put things in place to affect change. We just, I think we've just grown up with it so long we don't know another way. Um, now, that's not necessarily how it is in all firms, but I do think when leadership sets the tone, um, that's your foundation. Yeah. There's one way in the back. So we can try. <laughs> we, we have way coming? Okay. Good afternoon, Ruth. Thank you for a great keynote and inspirational few words. Is from my perspective as a student, you spoke uh, in the discourse of architecture and you, through your experience and someone in your position of what they can do uh, to enable students. What can I do as a student and particularly a man in this uh, educational facility to better uh, enable other people different than I am? Great question. Um, you know, I, I'm going to preface my answer to your question by saying that, you know, I struggled a little bit with um, making the topic um, solely focused on, on women. Um, you know, the, the event kind of demanded that. But I do think the lens um, just inherently needs to include, you know, all gender, all diversity, uh, you know, racial diversity, economic diversity, social diversity. Um, that's really the lens we're talking about, even though we're talking about the slice this weekend that is, is women. Um, so I think that empathy of putting yourself in other people's shoes and really asking questions of each other, getting to know each other, and um, maintaining the benefit of the doubt and awareness that not everyone is bringing something different to the table, and it's okay to ask and find those things out and then embrace them in, um, in your team dynamic or your, your office dynamic. So I think it's leading to more openness between people um, because you just realize you need to find out more about the people around you so that you can um, be supportive and, and sensitive and encouraging.
I guess they don't see me. I, I don't need a mic unless, <laughs> unless, unless you hear, hear me. Uh, what I have here is perhaps, uh, rather than a question, maybe uh, a comment here, because we are talking about architecture and quite clearly the, all of us somehow related to architecture and the University of Illinois, but I wonder if what could be solved within the field of architecture and in offices and wherever women, men work together and I have a feeling that it should start somewhere above, meaning it is a societal issue, wherein the uh, uh, role of women is changing, but it has to be that accordingly, their counterpart, meaning are the males, will have to change too. And this is that what I, I think um, will have to involve on a broader kind of uh, context. And I think particularly today, in this milieu in which we live today, which is not really conducive to equality, let's put it that way. But I think we have to particularly push toward that. And I believe any of these events, but we are participating right now here, 
uh, is, a, is a great uh, contribution to that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And yeah. Well, so in that sense, I just want to finish. Thanks for your <laughs> keynote speech, and thanks for the mic. <laughs> All right, we'll give Ruth the last word, and then we'll head over to the exhibit. <clears throat> us better, they make you know, our society better, our community is better, mm. but I think we firmly believe it makes the work better. Mm. Yes, we're doing it because it's important, but it's not just a feel-good box check, it makes the work better, and we are seeing that. These are award-winning projects, so I think mm. if we're here about architecture, I think that's also a, a really important thing to understand, mm. and that's why we're all